Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. I'm excited to have Julie Bennett joining me tonight. Hi Julie. Hi. <laughs> so a little bit about Julie. Julie was born in New Zealand and migrated to Australia after her father was offered a full-time role as a tenor in the Australian Opera Company. Her first novel, The Understudy, was inspired by her experience performing as a child extra in the Australian Opera Company's 1973 production of War and Peace. She lives in Sydney with her husband and gorgeous Kelpie Cross cattle dog, Riley. So thanks so much for joining me, Julie. Thanks for having me, Jackie. Just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a bit about The Understudy. Sure. So this understudy is the story of Sophie and she's a young and ambitious um, soprano and she has to step into the spotlight when the uh, star soprano goes missing, mysteriously goes missing. So she steps up into the spotlight and she's pretty, pretty good at it. And she also steps into the arms of a handsome Italian tenor. And she's hoping that she might win his affections so that she can further her career on the international stage. But in the background, of course, there's the missing Margaret and what's happened to her. So it's about ambition, passion, betrayal. And it's set in 1973 at the royal opening of the Sydney Opera House. And yeah, and I've read it and have to say it's very exciting. Um, Thank you. Are you able to tell us maybe a bit more behind your story of um, being in the Opera House? Because I think that's a really exciting part of the story yes. behind your story. Yes. So, uh, as you said, I was um, a child extra in War and Peace in 1973. I was 11. And it was, it's considered the first opera performed in the Sydney Opera mm. House. And it was a, about a month before the official opening. So it wasn't at the opening of the official opening of the Opera House, but it was about a month before. So it was, it was really cool. I didn't realise how cool it was until many years mm. later. Um, but my job really was to just walk out on stage, you know, looked a bit lost and lonely uh, with a whole bunch of other Russian peasants and just go from one side of the stage to the other and walk off again so it was really walk on walk off but um the only stage directions we really got was to you know sort of look like a, an orphaned peasant child and uh, not not do anything else whatever you do don't look around you you know at the, mm. or at the audience or just just be in the moment and I thought my recollection of this was I was really good you know I was <laughs> so super cool and a great little actress and uh, last year, I think it was, or during, certainly during COVID, the Australian Opera Australia streamed the footage of that very first. Oh, opera. they did. Okay. Yeah. And I was able to see myself, <laughs> which was pretty amazing. And here I am, you know, looking around like, <laughs> that was anything but cool. And I do remember we were in a, a few operas, my sisters and I, over a few seasons. And I do remember once also not doing what I was told, which seems to be a bit of a theme in my life. And um, I looked out at the audience and there were these ladies, you know, all dressed up in their finery, mm. in their, um, in their like, um, big hair, of course, in 1973 mm. and fantastic jewellery and makeup. And I went, oh, that's terrifying because <laughs> I didn't expect to be able to see anyone. And so I think it was then I decided I might take the stage directions and not do what they told me not to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then when, of course, you allow yourself to be involved in what's going on in the, in on stage, then you have a fabulous time because it's like a world of make-believe and mm. you can leave all your little problems behind, you mm. know, and enter into this other world. I, I just found it amazing and fabulous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and did you ever have anyone famous watch any of your performances? Oh, gee, I don't know, maybe. I mean, I do know that um, that very first opera, it, it's actually really interesting because in my professional life, I met a woman who um, I was telling her the story behind the understudy and I told her that little bit about being in War and Peace. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, do you mean the War and Peace that was in, in, on in September 1973 before the actual official opening? I said, yes, that's what I... That's what I mean. And she goes, I was in the audience. Oh, okay. And her dad had been a, um, you know, a company, um, some sort of, in some company and had wanted uh, to bring all the sort of um, people from all over his company and important, you know, heads of business. And mm. 
um, a flight delay had meant that they not all arrived. Oh. So he said to his daughter, you have to come and meet the audience. <laughs> so she was. And that's that was just so freaky that somebody, mm. you know, I was on the stage and she was watching at, mm. that, at that time. Mm. Um, so the answer is that uh, that night there probably were there probably were famous people because everyone wanted to be there. But, yeah. you know, I was 11, I was 11 didn't really know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the missing star of the opera, is that mm. a story that, like, something that you've heard that has ever happened before? Well, it, I haven't heard of the um, the star of the show going missing for mm. a long period of time, but it is fair to say that um, understudies do have to step up and often at the last minute because the thing about being a principal, having a principal role, is obviously you want to perform it, mm. and uh, so you don't want to miss any of that. So, um, you know, they, they try very hard to always go on, but the voice is an instrument, and, you know, um, sometimes you might get flu, then you can't sing for example mm. and so and you're trying not to get sick but the understudy really does have to step in and it's um in, interestingly we went to see the um the opening night of madame butterfly at the opera house this season and, and the tenor had to uh go halfway through because oh halfway through wow. yeah and then okay. the understudy had to step yeah, in so okay. yeah it happens um yeah. mysteriously disappears for a really long time probably not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um <laughs> But definitely understudies have to step and up. And especially yeah. with all the sicknesses going yes. around at the moment. Yes. So yes. it might be a bit more common at the moment as well. Yes, mm. yes. Mm. Mm. And can you tell us how you got around to writing the story? Was it something that had always been in your head to do? or? Yeah. Well, I always scribbled, you know, even as a child. I think I told my mum when I was 10 that I was going to write my autobiography. I was mm. younger than 10, actually because I was still in New Zealand. And she said, maybe I should uh, get some life experience first. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I'm nearly 10. I have nearly 10 years life experience. <laughs> but I, took, I did take her advice. And But then I was always scribbling as a kid. I loved English. And um, and then I wrote some sort of like what I call practice novels, so little novelette sort of things. But, you know, life gets in the way and mm. you put your you put your writing and creativity aside sometimes when you're raising families and working and establishing careers and so forth. And then a terrible thing happened one day. I woke up and I realised I was in my 50s <laughs> and I hadn't done what I said I was going to do. Mm. So I decided that I'd give it a red hot go. You know, I'd, I'd try really hard to do what I'd always wanted to do. And um, I, I thought, you know, no matter what, because it's, you know, in your 50s, at least you do have more of your own time. Your family's not so young. So I decided to write this novel. And then, of course, the question is, what are we going to write about? Mm. And I remember when I was working in libraries and I was always scribbling then too, and a librarian, I think it was, who said to me, you know, you should write a novel that's um, informed by your background in, or your family's background in theatre because people would be really interested in that. And I thought, you know, oh, I guess. But, you know, in one way it was my dad's job. It was just my dad's job because dad worked in the opera for 30 years. Mm. And I thought, you know, would people be interested in my dad's job? Mm -hmm. And um, then you realise, well, it's not a regular nine to five job, you know, it's something a little bit out of the ordinary. So I guess so. And that's how it started, really. Um, I just decided that that would be the background. It mm. would be, you know, I wanted it to be a mystery, but also have romance. And I wanted to have a strong character who is motivated by strong ambitions and, um, you know, a woman sort of coming in the 1970s, coming into her own and really wanting to succeed mm, yeah mm. and when you decided that that's what you wanted to do how hard or easy was it to get something published <laughs> it's always difficult mm. um the first difficulty of course is yourself because you i at least took a long time to do it i went along to fiona mcintosh's master class and i was um i was supposed to go the following year but mm. she had a vacancy come up so she I thought I had a whole year to write a book, but said, well, come along. It doesn't have to be the whole book. You just need the first 10 pages. Mm. So I just dashed off these 10 pages. And um, interestingly, those 10 pages are pretty much, I think, from rem memory, not changed very much, those mm. first 10 pages. Anyway, I went along to that, and then I came back from that, and I, um, I wrote 30,000 words pretty quickly. 
No, and I was pretty proud of myself. I went to uh, Scotland where my girlfriend was um, living at the time. And she said, how's it going? I said, I'm so proud of myself. I've got 30,000 words. She goes, well done. She came back to live three years later. And my answer to her question was the same. I still only <laughs> had 30,000. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like three year gap. <laughs> um, so then she said, I want to pay today, no excuses. And so that's how I got it written, right? So a page a day and I finished writing it. And then of course you've got to find a publisher who's interested mm. you've got to pitch to it and so forth mm. and as as things happened um fiona had a master class where she had five publishers and i thought well that's great because i'll be able to pitch to at least three of those and it's not just about pitching your work it's understanding what they want you know mm. what to publishers want what are they looking for what genres um you know things like how long does it have to be you know like just stuff like that so i went to that and i i met the five publishers and um from there it was a matter of you know seeing who might be interested in the work so from where to go you know it probably took me five years but it was five years you know i had three years out not writing uh, then i finished it so it's probably probably another year before you know it was accepted but yeah mm. it's it's hard because the reason it's hard is because there's such incredible talent in australia mm. you know everyone's really especially some of the um established authors but also the debut authors are amazing yeah. you know the talent is yeah. amazing but i know? think yours book like when you look at other ones that are out of that yours is a little bit different though as well mm. which yes. is, which <laughs> yeah which is a good thing Yes, mm. yes, it's a, it's a kind of, well, it's not a unique background, but it's an interesting background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And could you, like, it sounds like you had an interesting childhood. What did you like mm. reading when you were growing up? Oh, well, I was big into the um, historical fiction, like all the, um, you know, um, Victoria Holt and mm. Philip Carr and Jean Play, and I know they're all the same person, and, um, and Catherine Gaskin, and I really loved those works. Um, I think I started reading them when, when I was about 13, and I kind of just kept on reading that kind mm. of thing. So now I really love Philippa Gregory, you know, and um, I just love history, and I love the, the sense of, you know, that all, some of these authors can draw you into these worlds and really capture, you can really imagine yourself in those mm. worlds, and I love that. And I think that's an extension maybe of my theatrical background, that that's about pulling you into worlds that you don't really belong to, yeah. but you can pretend, you know, it's, mm. it's kind of an escapist um you know escapist sort of thing and i really loved it i mm. loved them you know loved mm. gone with the wind you know and then stuff like that yeah yeah and yeah. we've got quite a few people watching so just wanted to mention to the people watching if you do have any questions for julie please type them in comments and i can read them out um kelly's got a good question she wants <laughs> to know what has been the best part of your writing journey and do you wish that you had published earlier? Um, the best part of it is finally doing it. Mm. <laughs> um, the, and the best part for me is the actual writing. Before you get into editing, before you get into polishing, before all that, where you're very, very free. Of course, I'm a big pantser, and I know you know what that means, and probably everyone listening does too, but that's, you know, I just write by the seat of my pants. I don't mm. have a very well-formed plot. I have a, usually a really good idea of who my characters are, and, of course, that helps you to create plot as you go. But it's also, you know, tricky not to plot because you don't know where your character's going, mm. going to take you. Um, so, I, But I really like that because it's like discovery. You know, you mm. discover things and you can imagine things. You can make anything happen that you want to make happen. And that's really great. But um, the next bit, uh, best bit, is this bit, you know, where you get to take your book out into the world yeah. and you meet so many people. Mm. And, you know, I've had a fan moment where a fan just saw me and recognised me, ran across <laughs> the room, and that was really, really exciting. Kind of, you know, you think, oh, okay. <laughs> that was really great. And getting fan mail, you know, and stuff like that. It's really lovely. And it was so nice to be embraced by people and to have people in interested and excited about the book. Mm. Um, do I wish I'd started earlier? Well, I feel like I was always writing, but, um, you know, I always sort of believe that things happen at the time they happen mm. and you can't unfortunately you can't force it really because 
Um, before this, I was, you know, um, a career woman and I, I'm still, you know, I still run my own business mm -hmm. and I have demands on my time and I have family and I like to travel and so on. And you've got to live a life as well. So if I, if I'd been able to be you know, published before this, that would have been great, but I think it just would have been different, yeah. you know, and now is the time for me and that's mm. fantastic. At least I've got it. <laughs> yeah, no, great answer. Yeah. And um, Carly says she loves the cover and she wonders if you have much input on it. I'm wondering if it's, I can see your cover in the back, but it's quite far yeah. away. Do you think yeah. um, you can bring it a bit closer? So, Cause that's, yeah, it's a beautiful cover, isn't it? It's lovely, and this is all a little bit raised. And mm. Lovely. Um, so traditionally, you don't really have much say in your cover, of what I've heard from other authors. What happened with my cover was um, my publisher, Cassandra, she had a vision for it a long time before it was published, you know, in quite early days. And she described to me that she wanted um, Sophie with her bright red hair on the, on the cover. And you know and i was kind of i don't know if i should admit this but i was kind of like yeah that's pictures i'm words <laughs> <laughs> my job was words you know and i was very focused at the time on words and i thought yeah sounds great and then um the arc was a little different the arc didn't have a um a woman on the cover but what happened after that was they actually had a photo shoot and this is an actual model Oh really? I can't. Modeling my dress. Yeah. Modeling. Okay. <laughs> um, and it, I thought it was just beautiful. It's mm. just I was really happy with it. But apparently you don't traditionally. But I, I was really lucky. I sort of. Yeah. And I and I think I liked uh, Cass's idea from the very beginning. So that was really great. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And Belinda wonders if you've got another book that you're working on at the moment. Look, I do. I'm not allowed to talk about it much yet. Mm. But it it will be historical, albeit in another time period. And mm. it will have mystery, passion, betrayal. Mm. <laughs> and set in Australia? Uh, yes, set in Australia, yeah. yes. And um, it will have quite a, a little bit of um, a theatrical kind of background, okay. but not quite, yeah. not quite as much as this one, but mm. a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sure everyone will be waiting to see that one. How far yeah. along are you with that? Um, well, I do have to deliver it soon, so I'm, mm. you know, it's in draft mode, but I'm happy with how, how it's progressing, you know, a little more time. Um, but yeah, I have to deliver soon, so not that far away. Mm. <laughs> and Kelly wonders, other than Fiona McIntosh, have you had any other writers who have inspired you? Um, all writers are really um, inspiring, you know, but I think the ones that you, that you, go to the ones that you keep coming back and you keep mm. buying those are the ones that are really inspirational i used to love bryce courtney's annual tome you know i used to really look forward to it and same with may finchy but unfortunately passed mm. um you know it's all, all you know all writers are inspirational because it's um it's like being on this well i heard some one of them tell me um you know it's like being on a mountain you're at the foot of the mountain and you go i can't possibly do this you know i can't climb that it's too mm. too big and then you get on the mountain you go oh well i'll give it a go and you reach to various stages along the way and you think you're at the top and you're not you mm. know um so it's like every every plateau you reach is like yay made it but there's yeah. another one to climb <laughs> so that analogy really worked for me and it was you know yes and appreciate every stage of the process you are getting to the top takes a really long time but you'll get there if you mm. stay on the mountain but you won't if you don't yeah <laughs> <laughs> and elise wonders how you organize your writing day Oh, that's really interesting because, as I said, I also run a PR business, so I'm probably 50-50, mm. you know, I, I, and I have to do my writing after hours. But that suits me because I'm a night person mm. and night is the quietest period of the day for me. So what I do is uh, I often write late at night in bed <laughs> and I often get up first thing in the morning before 9am and, and write again then because those are the times that are sort of quiet for me. And I don't... I, I I really don't have a set pattern for how I work or the times that I work or even a, a space. I could easily, as I said, I write in bed, but I also write on the mm. sofa and I'm in the car and not when I'm driving, of course, <laughs> uh, all sorts of different places. But um, 
I find that not having the structure is more creative for me. And I know yeah. that other people work differently and they're very disciplined and they, you know, they, they do it a different way. But the thing that I do that is a little more structured is I will, I make myself write that page a day. Mm. So it's, you know, it's only up to about four or 500 words. And if that's all I write that day, I feel still that I've made progress. Um, obviously some days you write 2000 words and other days you just, I'm going to, I'm going to make it do not, not don't. So I've got an extra word and it's going <laughs> yeah. to fill up the page faster. But I find that if I try and force myself to structure really solidly in the beginning, it's, it's quite limiting for me mm. just for the way that I work. And anyway, when I tried to do this, I did try a couple of times to do it, particularly with the understudy. Um, my characters are like going off doing something else. Sort of like, <laughs> I feel like I'm in a cocktail bar and they're sitting there at another table going, yeah, Jules. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. <laughs> That's how I feel. Like they develop yeah. their own personalities and minds of their own and take the plot where I've never even thought. So Yeah. No, that, yeah. That's, that's a great answer. Um, <laughs> could do you tell us um what sort of research you did for your book? So it was very helpful to have been alive in the era, mm, mm. <laughs> but it's memory is a terrible author. And that's what I, um, what's what I say to people when they say, oh, well, you lived through it. So it was not easy. They never say easy, but mm. you know, you've got a bit of an understanding of the time period. Yes, you do. But A, I was a child and B, it's a very long time ago mm -hmm. and, and C, you know, the things that you think were true are not necessarily. So you have to do a, a lot of research. So I, I, when I go to all the talks in libraries and so forth, I take my little kit bag and show people some of the, um, some of the research that I use. And I always preferred what I call primary sources, which were actual newspapers, for example, mm. you know, actual tangible things that I could validate, you know, that this would be, it, you know, even supposing a, a newspaper article wasn't entirely accurate. It was what un people understood at that time, yes, that, you know, yeah. at that time. So mm. that's what I wanted. Of course, I read a lot. I had my father's memorabilia, which was very helpful. And um, it's, a, it's a process of discovery. And I found myself getting very obsessive about getting detail right. So, you know, the first, as I say, the first draft is my favorite because you're very creative and loose. Mm. You don't really worry about stuff like that. But then one of the first scenes in the understudy is Sophie and Amando were walking up Macquarie Street. And so figuring out that, okay, so they would have been doing that between 5 and 6 p.m. What kind of weather was it in October 1973? <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> when did the sun set? Mm -hmm. And was it raining? Because it wouldn't have been a very good... <laughs> Yeah. walk you know? <laughs> and and was there daylight saving so all that thing mm. i had to research that because i didn't want to i just wanted it to feel authentic so that yeah. if people had been alive at the time they remembered mm. and so for example on the day of the opening the royal opening of this in the opera house was really windy really really windy okay. the queen had to hold her skirts down oh, to read okay. her speech and her, her notes of fluttering in the breeze yeah. so and you know they had uh balloons and doves and they all just got whipped up and out oh. to sea so and that was all great color also mm. of course to add to the novel yeah. Mm. yeah and when you were doing your research was there anything you found that really surprised you wow there were lots of things you know the things about the curtains you've read the book so um you know Coburn's curtains and the sad story behind that because mm. they only hung in the opera house for such a really short time I think by the next year I've got, I saw some YouTube footage. I just can't remember exactly what year it was, but I think it was 1974. And uh, um, Coburn was talking about the curtains with uh, somebody like a journalist and was saying he couldn't understand why they'd been taken down. Mm -hmm. And the argument was that they were too modern, you know, they were too yeah. out there mm -hmm. and they didn't fit with traditional sets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think the Opera House is a traditional building, so I think no. we could have been away with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to me, that was really surprising. And also, um, I discovered that he didn't get paid for those curtains oh, or he didn't really? get paid in full or something uh, like that. It was certainly a bitter um, end to mm. the story of the curtains, which had been such an amazing, you know, feat he'd gone to 
France and it was uh, the, the tapestry weavers over there made the curtains from Australian merino wool. It was like mm. such a work of art. And I was fortunate enough that at the very time I was um, researching the actual opera house, uh, suddenly on my, because I follow everything on socials, of course, the opera house came out with, oh, we're going to hang Coburn's curtains for the first time in X years. Oh, in the really? Opera house. Oh. And, and ordinary people can come along and see them. And oh. I'm going like, wow. I just... I am a believer in serendipity, but that was pretty amazing. Yeah. And they are gorgeous, mm. absolutely gorgeous. Mm. Yeah. Did yeah. you remember them from at the time or when you were I don't there? really know if no. I remember them. As yeah. soon as I saw them, I thought I remembered them. Mm. But whether I remember, I do remember thinking that the yellow ones are really bright and the, I preferred the blue ones. I remember mm. that when I was a kid because that was Curtains of the Moon. Mm. And uh, Curtain on the Sun, Curtain on the Moon. And one's, one was in the Opera Theatre, which is now the Joan Sutherland Theatre. And the other one was in the Drama Theatre, I think. So it was, um, I remember them, but I don't know if I remember them until, yeah. until I saw them. Saw you know them what I mean? yeah. 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 And what about what you like reading yourself? Just wondering if there might be something you've read lately you'd like to recommend to us. I go to um, I go to as many book launches as I can, and I always buy the books. But unfortunately, when I'm uh, writing, I have to read a lot of research, so I don't have as much time to read novels. I always buy them, and they're in a great big book stack. But I find I'm not unusual there. People have lots oh, of book stacks. You sound like lots of us. <laughs> 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 but um, I have started Nina D. Campbell's um, Daughters of Eve. Oh, yes, and, that's which, a great one. Yeah, yep. Crime Thriller, mm -hmm. which I'm finding really great. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also um, had a had a sneak preview at a manuscript recently, but I obviously can't talk about it, but it was really good, mm -hmm. really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's yeah. great. And yeah. do you have a your own little connection with authors that you may – share things or share experiences with and yeah so out of fiona's master class she has a sydney uh, new south wales cohort and we get together quite a lot with them mm. uh, i get together quite a lot with them and it's we just went to uh, michael robottom's launch uh, of his latest book and in fact he, he's the one who told the story about being on the mountain um and yeah we get together quite a lot and you know the community of writers is just so fabulous and so supportive and it's a great cohort of mostly women um there have been a few men and they've been equally as warm and welcoming and it's so wonderful that it's not about you know anyone having you know being precious about their work it's all about that community mm -hmm. it's been really good really good and do you have any quirky writing rituals? <laughs> Not really. I do. I do dream a bit about things. Mm -hmm. um, with Sophie and Amando, I've dreamt about them so vividly after it had gone to print. Yeah. And I wrote. I wrote. I woke up. So I'm going like I just can't believe they came to me in a dream at the end. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't come to me at the beginning. But yeah. of course, you, you can't have them in your head until you've created them. So of course, um, so and but also now that I'm writing the next one, I also have a few dreams about it. You know, and I know when it's going well, I have this dream of flying. You know, and it's great we we're mm. going. But then there's also you know, periods where nothing comes, but it's it's the dreams, I think, mostly. The other thing that happened to me when writing this book was um, the characters. I knew Sophie really well, but I didn't really know Margaret. She just mm. uh, came to me and she was the one talking in my head. She, she just, she was a very cross person. And she kept mm. saying, write this, tell them that. <laughs> she was very, you know, very strong and i mm. and i had to try and turn her down a little bit but she wouldn't have it you know yeah. she wouldn't have it. and that sounds weird but i've talked mm. to other authors it's not so weird yeah. <laughs> and did you do any spe things special to celebrate when you finished the understudy? well of course it was around the end of COVID, mm. so not as special as um as i had planned in my head mm. you know Rent out the opera house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it reminds me, the day I remember is the day that Cassandra rang me to tell me the book had been accepted for publication. Mm -hmm. And I was so shocked, you know, because I, I just wasn't expecting it. I didn't realise she was ta even taking it to acquisitions. I didn't mm -hmm. realise that. I just thought she said she was going to show it to some colleagues. I just thought she was going to, you know, 
we've started mm. some colleagues but she took a tech positions and she rang me and told me and i'm just like oh good <laughs> <laughs> and then i went oh, oh. and then then i realized you know it took a while to process the fact that it had been accepted and that you know that they wanted at least two books and maybe three and um mm. Then I, we were actually driving around at the time and I said to Bruce, drive us to the Opera House. So um, he drove me up to the Botanic Gardens and I, we overlooked the Opera House and I just watched the sun go down on it. And it was, you know, there were other celebrations, of course, where there was champagne, but that's the moment I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, nice. Yeah. Well, mm. thanks so much for chatting oh, with me. Yeah. It's been great talking to you. You too. And good luck with your next book. Thank you. I'll be back to talk yeah, about that. Yeah, make sure <laughs> you are. Um, and also <laughs> just want to thank the people who joined in and the questions that people asked. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been lovely. Do you want to let people know how they can keep in touch with you? Absolutely. So I've got a website, juliebennettauthor.com.au. So you can contact me through that. Um, or I'm also on socials, of course. So LinkedIn. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, my favourite. Mm. <laughs> Instagram, you don't have to say very much, which is great. Put, put some pretty yeah. pictures up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, please do follow me. Please buy yeah. the book. And <laughs> and uh, if you love it, feel free to review it. And if you don't, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much and bye, everybody. Later. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye.